Hi everyone, welcome to our seventh session of our six month biocontrol technical workshop series of the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Action Plan. I'm very pleased to be hosting this session. I'm back again and this time I'm joined by three new experts uh, who are going to speak on the potential for conservation biocontrol to help manage fall army worm. Uh, I also have Pranav, our technical platform whiz, helping us out in the background. So if you have any problems, please chat to him in the chat box. Right, I'm just going to underscore again that we have a very busy agenda. Uh, we're gonna move quite fast, but there will be time for questions and answers, um, lots of time. Uh, and we'll have a summary at the end as well. And a few, two poll questions just to warm us up uh, at the start. And before we begin, I just want to quickly go over how to use the platform. Many of you know how to use this already very well. We've been using this for the last six months and so, I just really want to emphasize that if you have questions and answers, and we really want lots of questions um, coming in, please use the Q&A box uh, there. That's where we want all the questions to go. If you want to share your resources, your information, your studies, uh, if you want to congratulate one of our speakers on their amazing presentation, please put that in the chat box. Uh, and that's a very good way to interact uh, with others in the room. Uh, if you have any problems, again, please just try actually logging off and on, or First, you can send a message to Grow Asia in the chat and Pranav will try to help you. Okay, just a reminder that this ASEAN Action Plan Fall Army Worm Biocontrol Technical Workshop Series is supported by Grow Asia and a whole host of regional and international uh, experts and organizations. Uh, it's been running for six months and we're really keen to have your feedback and interaction on it. And you can go to the ASEANFAWaction.org site and actually uh, provide feedback and thoughts and share your work there. If you wish to have a certificate of participation for this uh, workshop, you must subscribe to the biocontrol forum and either ask a question, share something interesting about biocontrol or note something you found useful in the biocontrol series. And that's how you will get your participation certificate and then email me. Uh, and here is what you have to do. You just log on to the ASEANFAWaction.org, go to the forum. Uh, you'll be asked to log on there um, and you can contribute to that biocontrol for FAW forum there. Uh, any problems, just email FAW at growasia.org. And today we are up to session seven, hard to believe, time has flown. Uh, next session on the 6th of May will be around biocontrol as part of an IPM approach. Uh, then we'll take a bit of a break till sort of mid to late June and come back around biopesticides and a biocontrol integrative course workshop. So more news on that uh, will come out over the next couple of weeks. Now I'm just going to run a quick poll just to warm you up, make sure you're here and make sure we've got as many people in the audience who have arrived to the workshop. So these are not, uh, you know, uh, very scientifically rigorous questions, I'm afraid. I just wanted to really warm you up with something. And the questions here are, in general, do you think conservation biocontrol is likely to be too expensive for most farmers to implement? And it's just a yes, no, I don't know. Uh, and how many conservation biocontrol tactics or approaches can you name that might help farmers to manage fall armyworm in the field? Um, so it's just a bit of fun. Uh, have a go. It's anonymous, so I won't be picking out people in the audience to name their uh, four to six or eight plus biocontrol tactics. You will be safe. Um, but let's see what people are doing. We've sort of already got 91 people on board, so that's very good. And I'll give people another probably 15 seconds. And we're getting a bit more of a spread of responses soon. I'm gonna share the polling soon. I might just get it over 65. And Pranav, do you want to share the, share the results now? Okay, so you will see in general, do you think conservation biocontrol is likely to be too expensive? 51% no. There's 33% say yes. So we'll see what our experts have to say about that later uh, in their discussions. Um, two, how many conservation biocontrol tactic approaches or approaches can you name? 
Uh, and I'm just going to bring my thing down. I can't see them all. Lots of the audience are one to three, 62%, and we have a few experts there, 6% can name six plus. Uh, so that gives an idea to our speakers um, that quite a few of the audience know at least one, one to six uh, different approaches. And that gives you a little bit of background information. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move on to our next uh, slide and that is an introductory um, slide to introduce our first speaker. And our first speaker is Dr. Jeff Gurr from Charles Sturt University. Uh, he is the professor in applied ecology there. He is well known internationally for his work on applied insect ecology and developing ecologically based strategies to combat pests. His work over the last three decades has spanned biological control of insect pests, plant defense, insect vectored plant pathogens, chemical and molecular ecology. And his chief contribution has been to develop strategies for promoting the activity of natural enemies of pests and simultaneously delivering other ecosystem services. Welcome, Jeff. That was a bit of a mouthful, actually, um, I have to say. But nice well to have you on board. Thank you. And uh, I think you've got a strong relationship with New Zealand there as well in the past. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing your presentation uh, as um, both a uh, running this biocontrol sort of workshop series, uh, also as a New Zealander, and also as a very interested uh, conservation um, I guess, interest in conservation by control. So thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, let's get started. But before we dive straight into things, a quick sound check. Can people just nod if I'm coming through loud and clearly? Okay, well, no one's shaking their head at me, so that's encouraging. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, it is evening here in New South Wales, Australia. It's dark outside and rather cold. Um, so yes, good evening and good afternoon of you, uh, to you that are in uh, other parts of the world further to the um, west. Now, Alison has given me a, a two-fold challenge with this first presentation in tonight's very important um, event. And the first is to give you a, a general introduction to what this thing is, conservation biological control. And I'll, I'll cover that as best I can in the first half of my presentation. But then I'll move on and try to paint a picture that there are some very strong, very positive prospects for using conservation biocontrol against all army were. And before I dive into the, the first few slides in my presentation, I'll just dwell for a moment on those logos that you can see in my first slide by way of acknowledgement to the many and varied agencies and other donors that have supported my work over the past couple of decades. Okay, slide number two, please. So let's start off with a slide that might help people who perhaps don't have a uh, strong background in conservation biological control. And I'll try and explain why this particular, uh, sorry, this particular approach to biocontrol is important and relevant to agriculture in the current age. The overriding reason that it can be such a powerful approach is that crop lands are inhospitable to beneficial arthropods, insects and spiders. And the reasons for that are, are listed here, the major reasons at least. We often grow crops as large areas of monocultures. So just a single crop type in a field, often a very large field. Weeds increasingly are very well controlled. So the monoculture truly is a monoculture. And reflecting field sizes, it's a long distance to any kind of non-crop vegetation. And that's really important if you think for a moment that you are a, a small insect, 
like the surfid, the uh, hoverfly that you can see in the right hand image there. Now these insects are really voracious predators of soft bodied pests in their larval life stage, but the adults require uh, plant foods, in particular the females require a protein rich meal of pollen in order to mature their ovaries and without that their fecundity is very restricted. So imagine you're a hoverfly in the middle of that field where you can see the tractor, um, it's going to be a very inhospitable place for you to live, not only you being doused in insecticides, but also it's a long way for you to go to get any kind of pollen meal. So next slide please. Now an easy way for you to think about some of the chief mechanisms by which conservation biological control can remedy the factors that I've just been talking about is with the acronym SNAP. So just remember the snap of someone's fingers. And those four letters, S-N-A-P, can be used to stand for shelter, for nectar, for alternative prey or hosts, and for pollen. And these are the major resources that often are deficient in agricultural systems and which are often uh, provided in conservation biocontrol initiatives. And I'll acknowledge my uh, friend, uh, distinguished Professor Steve Ratton, who tragically died very recently as the person who dreamt up this SNAP acronym for us. Okay, next slide, please. Now let's just briefly consider the other forms of biological control. So we've all learnt about classical biological control, sometimes called inoculative biocontrol, where you look overseas to try and find a natural enemy of a pest, and you bring that natural enemy from its original home into the new continent. And there have been some beautifully effective classical biocontrol programs over the decades, indeed for over a hundred years. But there have also been some disasters. Uh, it's risky because those classical biocontrol agents might attack things other than the target pests. These days, it's a very slow approach to get a program running because of all the host specificity testing that is required in most countries. And that in turn makes it very costly. So keep that consideration in mind when you reflect back on that opening question from Alison's poll. One of the big advantages of conservation biocontrol is it can be much less costly than classical biocontrol. Now, the same applies to inundative biological control, where we make mass releases of insects, usually things like um, uh, trichogramma, parasitic wasps, or perhaps predatory mites, where they're bred in very large numbers by a company and sold to farmers. That in turn makes it a costly approach. And again, conservation biological control offers the advantage of being far cheaper. Another limitation of inundative biocontrol is there's a very, very limited range of agents that are available for sale. Now, the third specialized term that I've listed on this slide, just to try and make things really clear to people, is uh, you may have read about habitat management or sometimes called habitat manipulation. Now this is pretty much the same as conservation biological control, except that it, habitat management, includes non-natural enemy mediated effects. That's a bit of a mouthful, but what, what I mean by non-natural enemy mediated effects is that habitat management can involve manipulating vegetation and it having a direct effect on the target pests. A simple example there is a trap crop. So natural enemies aren't involved at all. It's not really um, a biological control form, 
but it is, if you like, a close cousin of classical biological control. Okay, next slide, please. Now, I'm hoping that you can see this slide in its entirety. For me, the bottom chunk is uh, chopped off, but it doesn't matter too much if you can't see all of it. The point I wanna make here is that this century, there has been a truly remarkable escalation in the level of research attention in this area of conservation, biological control and habitat manipulation. And I've been very lucky, I think, to have essentially built my career on this phenomenon. I guess I might have contributed to it slightly, but I've certainly built my career on this uh, rapid growth in research interest in conservation and biocontrol as a branch of pest management. So that um, trend you can see in the graph just represents the level of research attention focused as uh, uh, citations on various forms of conservation biological control. And what I want to talk about in the next several slides is the extent to which this level of research attention has filtered through and actually made a difference in the real world. Has it allowed farmers to improve the way they control pests? Next slide, please. Well, the answer to that question I just posed is uh, yes, the research has filtered through and made a difference because it actually works. And if you need some convincing about that, you can look at this uh, uh, paper from Nature Plants and the actual title states, multi-country evidence. So it's uh, evidence from multiple countries that this form of biological control that I'll I'll take you through in the next several slides, really can work in the context of Asian rice. And just by way of a heads up, one of our later speakers, Dr. Ping Yang Ju, he'll be uh, expanding on this uh, area. I'm just gonna give you a, a very brief tour through the highlights of some of the work that um, I've done and that Ping Yang has been involved in as well. So next slide, please. So we know from um, laboratory studies that some flowers, the smell of these flowers, attract parasitic wasps. Not just any old parasitic wasps, these are ones that attack major rice pests. And you can see here those bars simply show you the extent of attraction to volatiles from flowers compared with a clean air control. Next slide. Now, those wasps are not only attracted to the smell of flowers, they feed on those flowers, they take nectar, and that has a very profound effect on the biology of the wasps. Uh, the headline finding here is that the wasps live longer than they feed on nectar. And that highlighted number there, 28, just shows the average number of days that the, um, the wasps live when they're fed with um, access to flowers as well as water compared to only 17 days when they have water alone. So the nectar, the calories in the nectar actually make a big difference to the performance of these biocontrol agents. Next slide, please. Now, because those wasps live longer, they're also able to mature more eggs in their ovaries and they parasitize more eggs. So with flowers, each female was found in this laboratory study to parasitize 21 plant hopper eggs compared with only 14 eggs when those wasps were denied access to a nectar meal. Next slide. And the good news here is that whilst those previous slides were showing us all encouraging results about how good nectar was for parasitoids, they, uh, the flowers are not good for pests, such as the adult moths of rice leaf folder. And so these are quite safe plants to grow around the edge of a rice field 
uh, you can promote the biology of parasitic wasps, the beneficial insects, without running the risk of accidentally encouraging some of the moth pests. Next slide, please. Okay, so everything I've told you so far is essentially results from laboratory studies. And now I'm gonna move on and talk about the field work that we conducted on multiple sites in China and in Thailand and Vietnam, and which compromised the, the findings in that Nature Plants paper. There were 16 sites we used over the course of four years. And on each of our sites, we had a group of fields under a so-called ecological engineering treatment. That's just a fancy word for conservation by control. And we collected data from those, as well as from a comparable cluster of fields several hundred meters away in which normal farmer practice was maintained. Next slide. Now I'm gonna take you through these results really quickly because um, the headline results at least are really easy to understand. And if you want to deep dive into the fine detail, you can uh, look at that article in Nature Plants. So the first thing is, the first major finding that we, um, we established here was that in this uh, intervention treatment with flowering plants established in the borders of rice fields, we had significantly enhanced levels of uh, parasitism of the plant hopper pests. Next slide. And that in turn led to dramatically reduced numbers of pests. Now, a couple of aspects of detail on this slide that I will dwell on is that, uh, bear in mind, we're looking at a logarithmic scale here. So those differences between the intervention treatment and the control treatment, where you've got the, uh, the means higher at the early and the late stage of the season, because that's a logarithmic scale, we're getting a massive effect, a massive reduction on pest numbers. And any of you who have conducted research, ecological type research in the field over multiple years of multiple sites, indeed multiple countries in this case, would realize that it can sometimes be hard to get a strong uh, signal to noise ratio. There's so much variability in these ecological data sets. But to get such a remarkably clear signal in this case shows that something very profound is happening as a result of our conservation biocontrol intervention. Next slide. And indeed, our host growers recognized that something quite special was happening in their fields and of their own volition, because they were making decisions about pesticide use, they, the host growers, dramatically reduced the numbers of sprays from over three per year on average to just one uh, on average. Next slide. And that uh, saving in terms of costs from reduced pesticide needs was complemented by another great benefit. The farmers were actually getting a higher grain yield, a higher rice yield in the intervention treatment by virtue of the fact that the pests were kept in check. Next slide. And when you analyze these two production systems, the, the standard farmer practice versus our intervention using conservation biocontrol, you find that you're getting a 7.5% economic advantage of using conservation biocontrol. So this feeds directly into that question that Alison posed to everyone at the start of the presentation about whether conservation biocontrol might be too costly. Well, the answer seems to be from this case study at least, that any costs are um, very strongly recouped by an overall economic advantage caused by higher crop yields combined with reduced costs of pesticide inputs. Next slide. Now, I'm gonna give you, I think, just one more example of a successful case study to reinforce this point that conservation biocontrol has well and truly moved on from being a, a topic of great research interest right the way through into something that makes a difference on the ground. And two major projects have been conducted in my group, one funded by the McKnight Foundation, 
working in Africa and the second founded right here in Australia by an organization called Hort Innovation. And one thing that's interesting about Hort Innovation is that they distribute money, um, they distribute growers money, they distribute farmers money. And they gave us close to a million dollars a couple of years ago to develop conservation biocontrol techniques in Australian vegetable crops. And this I think is a very, very powerful signal that conservation biocontrol is now perceived by farmers as a way to avoid some of the problems like insecticide resistance that plague conventional agriculture. So let's move on to the next slide, please. In this Australian work that I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, we were focusing our attention on three spatial scales. So conservation biocontrol related effects that occur within the field. And secondly, the field adjacent vegetation, so what's growing just at the edge of the fields. And thirdly, the landscape scale, so what's happening across multiple fields and other land uses. Next slide. So first of all, at the within field scale, we used flowering strips a little bit similar to those that I showed you in the rice. And we established those within vegetable fields. And you can see here in that left-hand graphic with the orange line and the blue line, that we've got dramatically enhanced numbers of natural enemies in areas of crop, sorry, in areas of crop that were close to these flowering plants. And those beneficial, effects extended for at least 15 meters into the crop itself, away from the flowering plants. And within those areas, we got double the rate of parasitism of our primary pest, which was diamondback moth. And again, harking back to this cost aspect that Alison told you about earlier, we calculated that the benefit cost ratio of this approach was eight to one. So in case you're not familiar with that way of expressing um, uh, impacts, for every dollar that the grower spent on, on buying seed and establishing the flowering plant strips, for every dollar they earned $8 by virtue of reduced pesticide costs and higher yields of uh, undamaged cabbages. So quite a stark benefit. Next slide. Now, we're also very interested in the effects of the field adjacent land use. So for example, if a field of vegetables was growing next door to another field of vegetables, or if it was growing next to some woodland or pasture, or even a lake. And we surveyed 491 fields over 12 months across all states in Australia. It's one of the biggest research exercises I've ever been involved with, 491 fields, massive. And we're able to distill the main findings down to what's summarized here in the red and blue boxes. So I won't read these out. I'll leave you to digest them in your own time. And I'm sure that Alison can share this PowerPoint file with you at a later date if you need to. But we're able to, um, obtain very powerful signals of exactly what happens um, to the pests and the natural enemies in a vegetable crop when you've got different types of neighboring land use. And if you just hit slide advance one more time, please. Okay, there we go then. And you can see that we've got um, some additional um, commentary here in red and green boxes. And this essentially then is the overall signal from our very large data set of what things will contribute to reduced densities of pests in crop and what things will contribute to uh, increased densities of natural enemies in the crop. And uh, just in case you don't have the kind of eyesight or uh, level of interest to read that fine print, suffice it to say that it really does matter whereabouts you site a vulnerable crop and the sorts of adjacent vegetation you establish and maintain on your farm. Okay, next slide, please. What we're able to do um, when we partitioned 
those results into particular crop types. And this uh, table you see here, <coughs> excuse me, is for brassica vegetables, things like cabbages. And there are equivalent tables for things like carrots and lettuce, for French beans and capsicum. Um, but we're able to show for each crop type in this heat map style, what the various effects were, whether red negative or green positive of each type of neighboring land use. So we're currently in the process of rolling these uh, information packages out to growers to provide them with better guidance on how to site crops and maintain vegetation diversity on their properties. Next slide, please. Okay, now here I'm moving on to that third spatial scale, which is what's happening um, at the landscape level in our landscapes. Now it's a little bit of a busy graphic here, so I'll try and talk you through it so it makes sense. We're concerned here on the, on the uh, horizontal axis with the proportion of croplands within a landscape at a spatial scale of one kilometer, a thousand meters. So a thousand meters away from a focal brassica crop, um, there's a, a big difference in the result that you get from establishing a flower strip. So let's look at that green dashed line, which you can see rising up from left to right. This shows the number of beneficials within a crop with the flowering strip. And you can see that it's a, a big effect if you add a flowering strip to a crop that's sited in a landscape with a high proportion of croplands. And a, a lack of effect, there's no point in doing it if you're operating the landscape that has very, very low proportions of croplands. And the, the reason for that, as you might imagine, is because in these complex landscapes with few crops, there's already lots and lots of non-crop vegetation, trees and bushes and hedgerows and wild plants, things that provide habitat and resources to natural enemies. So there's no point in adding a flowering strip. On the other hand, that's the right-hand side of our figure here. If you're in a landscape that's more typical of modern farming landscapes, where you've got something like perhaps 50, 60, 70% or even more of the landscape consisting of crops, there there's a real deficiency of habitats and resources for natural enemies. And so you can get a very big effect from adding a flowering strip. Okay, I hope I've explained that adequately well for you to digest it. Let's move on to the next slide, please. You have five okay. minutes, Jeff. That's fine, I can do that. So, <clears throat> Just going to very, very briefly talk about the next project, which um, we won funding for just two weeks ago, and that's to work in yet another contrasting type of uh, farming system, vineyards. And we've already got one PhD student, Annie Johnson, working in this, and uh, a, a second student and a postdoc will be joining her to develop ground cover treatments that will provide not only enhanced levels of pest control, but also we believe additional ecosystem services related to control of weeds, control of plant diseases, and reducing risk of frost damage to the, the precious wine grapes. Okay, next slide. So in this last couple of slides, I'm just gonna talk really briefly about prospects for full armyworm um, control using conservation biocontrol. And I very deliberately left this um, <clears throat> sketchy because what I'd really like to have as an outcome of this workshop is um, collaboration. I'd be very interested to work with people in other countries and I've really enjoyed seeing these little chat comments popping up from a whole bunch of different countries across the world. And, um, the next few slides will give the message that there, there is great scope for conservation biocontrol to be used against fall army worm, but it's going to require some effort to convert these 
interesting planks of evidence in the next few slides into a coherent research plan and into something that we could start rolling out into pharma fields in the near future. So let me just take you through um, the headline results from a few of these papers, which I think serve to make that point that conservation biocontrol really might work against full armyworm. So this first paper here by Meager and colleagues shows that uh, there really are parasitoids that are known to attack full armyworm and that those parasitoids are adversely affected when insecticides are used. So that's one of the um, ideas behind conservation biocontrol that I spoke about at the top end of my presentation. I mentioned the fact that part of conservation biocontrol is trying to reduce insecticide use and make fields a less toxic, a less unpleasant place for natural enemies to exist. Next slide. Um, and this, this study here by Hayro and colleagues makes the point that full army worm parasitoids are not only affected by insecticide use, as we saw on the earlier slide, but by vegetation patterns. So we're seeing here a broad agreement between the pattern of parasitism in uh, this system with full army worm and the earlier patterns that I showed you in the work with brassica vegetables and the previous work with, with rice eco-engineering. Next slide. And a step further was taken in this uh, next paper in actually identifying particular factors that might promote the natural enemies of full armyworm. This was work conducted in Honduras. And the next slide. Uh, this one is showing you that plant mediated effects are also powerful in influencing full armyworm impact. And this is a uh, part of the famous push-pull system developed at uh, ICIPI in Kenya. And although this is not strictly speaking a form of conservation biological control, it is what I referred to earlier as a close cousin in as much as it's a way of manipulating vegetation on farms as a way of having a direct effect on pests, irrespective of any effect that might occur by natural enemies. Okay, next slide, please. So in conclusion, I showed you very early in my presentation that conservation biocontrol has really exploded in volume as a research field this century. But I hope I've also convinced you that it, this is not just some esoteric theoretical area of research that has no bearing on the real world. It really has, at least in a few cases, and I've shown you a couple of case studies, made a difference. It's cost effective and can have a major impact on pests that cascade through to having major reductions in um, the level of plant damage. And I think there are huge opportunities for developing equivalent approaches in full armyware. Now, just finally then, um, I'm currently in a phase of expansion in my laboratory. I successfully completed six PhD students last year. So I've got um, scope to grow my group a bit more. And I'll be very pleased to hear from anybody who is interested in conducting a research master's or a PhD with me in Australia starting next year. Okay, I'll leave it there and um, take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, that was an excellent presentation. Um, we are running a bit out of time, so I'm going to speed through a couple of questions, but I really want people to ask questions in the Q&A box, and actually I can already see two very good ones. And Jeff will, can actually log on, and he can actually see the questions and answer those in writing as well later. I've got a couple of questions here, just quickly, Jeff, because we have to be really fast here. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's my question. I, I That was great to see the economic analysis done then because that is the question that we always have how much does this cost for farmers and is it cost effective and my question here I think you said they for every dollar spent 
you earned eight dollars or you had eight dollars back to the farmer right. if it's so good why aren't more farmers doing this i mean that that's an outstanding um return on investment it is yeah i think it's a knowledge gap um in the first place yep and secondly that eight to one ratio applies to using flowering plant strips in brassica vegetables yep. and equivalent research is yet to be conducted in the vast majority of crops and crop systems around the world. And if we were to kind of incrementally do these one by one, it's gonna take forever. So what we need to try and do, I think, is inspire uh, advisors and consultants and farmers themselves that these results signal the, um, the, the relative ease with which conservation biocontrol methods can be adapted and adopted. And so don't wait for a research project to be conducted in your particular part of the world for your particular crop. Get moving now, be inspired by the fact that there are successful case studies and play around, try to develop methods that are appropriate for your region. And I'm hoping that when Pinyang Ju presents his talk a little bit later, he might talk about a uh, ecological traits based approach that he and I developed that will, I think, help push that along and make it more accessible across across a wider range of systems. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, another quick question here, um, and that's I, I really like that answer, by the way. I think people do just need to get out there and start mm. trying things and sharing what actually happens. That's another important thing that gets forgotten. Um, how important do you think is it to consider it's something that I really liked? What you showed was the different scales. I mean, you showed the the idea of linking the infield, the field adjacent, and then a landscape um, approach. How important do you think that is to to understanding how beneficial conservation biocontrol okay. would be. Yeah, I think it's important, but I wouldn't let that be a distraction that uh, inhibited farmer groups and others getting out and just trying this. And yeah. um, it can be important. So for example, what I try to explain with that quite uh, complex graph was that if you add a flowering strip to a crop that's located in a landscape, that already has loads and loads of wild flowering plants, fairly obviously, it's not gonna have very much effect. So flowering strips are much more at home, much more powerful in what you might call an industrialized or intensive landscape where you've got lots and lots of crops and where otherwise there would be few opportunities for natural enemies to access shelter and pollen and nectar and alternative prey. Okay. Well, Jeff, we've we've really run out of time. I, I could have, I mean, this is the problem. We have such amazing presentations throughout the series. I could actually do <laughs> listen for hours on this stuff, but we do have to move on. So I'd like to thank you very much. There's some great stuff in that presentation. Indeed, we will be sharing it with everyone. Uh, it'll be on the website. Meanwhile, you've got over 11, 11 questions in the Q&A. If you could just have a look in there and when you answer those questions, they will come up and people should be able to see them. So it'll actually answer a lot of people's questions at the same time thank you very much jeff welcome Pleasure. right and uh, i'm sure you'll get some questions from interested uh, potential students as well so i encourage right. we do have lots of masters and, and doctoral students listening in so i encourage those people to get in contact with jeff so moving on, I'd like to uh, introduce Rhett Harrison. He has more than 25 years research experience in tropical landscapes. And I see he began his career studying the ecology of Bornean tropical rainforests, so this part of the world, uh, and transitioned to research on more applied environmental issues uh, after that. He joined the World Agroforestry Center in 2013, first in China and then moving to Zambia. He's a very strong interest in, in biodiversity um, and is also involved in the technical working group or one of the technical working groups, uh, I think on agroecology under the global action on fall armyworms. So welcome, Rhett. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna probably pressurize you a little bit with time here, but um, go for it. We're excited to have you join us. Thank you very much, Alison. Okay, so perhaps we move straight to my second slide then. So um, I'm talking more specifically about the management of uh, fall armyworm here. Um, and what we've learned about it so far. So there are a few things about the biology of the fall armyworm that we uh, need to keep in mind uh, when we're applying uh, 
these conservation biological control methods. So one of the first ones is that it's um, it can migrate long distance. So options, um, and it also feeds on a huge number of plants. So options to eliminating, uh, eradicating this pest are really not there in most of the, the tropical realm. Okay, it's a migratory pest in more temperate regions, but in the tropical regions, it's, it's already established and it can travel long distances very, very quickly so that pretty much all, your, all crops that are edible by it will be um, attacked. However, it's also attacked by um, a very large number of parasitoids um, in its, this is, these numbers come from its native range um, and uh, tie that also to the fact that it feeds on a lot of different crops. This is a very, very generalist um, organism and it's, you know, and therefore we can treat it, we can basically say that any caterpillar would be able to eat this caterpillar. Okay, over to the next slide. So um, in terms of management strategies, what, what we're interested here is contributing to a strategy of insect pest management. And this is uh, perhaps best thought of as this kind of a pyramid um, in which you have a bottom layer of um, actions that you take um, in the management of your fields on um, you know, a, a default basis. So these include uh, things like the, the types of interaction um, activities that we're talking about here, uh, cultural control, agroecology. Um, they also talk about the seed that you're going to select um, and uh, other actions like that, biological control. We then have uh, above that, we have the fact that you should be monitoring your fields for the pest and have thresholds for your action. If you are going to move to another action, such as applying a biopesticide or, or, a, or a synthetic pesticide, you only do this based on uh, an informed judgment from monitoring your fields. And we've got biopesticides and synthetic pesticides in this uh, pyramid of action here, but I just want to point out that some research on botanicals has shown that these are just as effective as the synthetic pesticides. And so there's no real, and, and they're much, much kinder to your natural enemies. So there's no real need to go to the uh, use of highly toxic chemicals in the control of uh, fall army worm. We can use uh, biopesticides and, and botanical pesticides. Uh, next slide. A major problem that we're uh, facing is that many countries and, and farmers um, have, in a knee-jerk reaction, have resorted to using very broad uh, spectrum pesticides. In many cases, these are even illegal in, in, uh, in European and uh, in Europe and America, uh, but they're being widely applied in Africa and, and other countries in Asia as well. Um, and this is pouring these toxic chemicals on the environment is both a human health hazard because they're often applied without uh, thought to uh, you know, the protective equipment and so forth. Um, and it's also, of course, uh, undermining these conservation biological control methods because it, it uh, negatively impacts uh, natural enemies. And in fact, there's good research uh, that shows that the, the natural enemies are often more impacted than the pest by many of these, uh, these highly toxic chemicals. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, when I'm talking about conservation biological control, I, I'm talking of, um, of that more broad um, concept of, of uh, conservation biological control. I, I often call it agroecological approaches, uh, which in, involves habitat manipulation as well as uh, direct interventions that would increase, for example, the abundance of parasitoids. Um, and I see these as uh, uh, involving three basic elements. The first is uh, managing your soils so that you have healthy soils and healthy plants through methods such as crop rotation, minimum tillage, mulching and composting. Particularly, uh, these focus on increasing the organic matter in soil. Um, this leads to healthier plants, uh, which are robust to pests and disease. Um, and therefore better able to compensate for any damage that the pest may inflict on them. Um, they also contribute, particularly the mulching and composting, also contributes to the diversity of 
natural enemies you get in fields because you get a, a healthier soil biology so you get predators and things living on the soil surface. Um, but we can also enhance the biodiversity at field to landscape scales. So uh, we just heard uh, some examples of that from, from Jeff. But these are things like uh, intercropping, applying field margins, perhaps practicing agroforestry, uh, diversifying your, your crop types at a farm scale, and also uh, forest protection at landscape scales. And then we might have some specific interventions that, that augment the, uh, the abundance of particular natural enemies. Uh, so these, this is the, in that SNAP example that was given to us by Jeff, this would be particularly uh, providing shelter or nest sites for uh, natural enemies, things like insect hotels or bat boxes. Um, fall armyworm is, is a moth and it is heavily preyed, preyed upon by, um, by insectivorous bats. So increase the abundance of bats in your fields and you'll likely have an effect on reducing the, the number of adult moths. Next slide. So um, one of the aspects to things, uh, can we move to the next slide? Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the aspects about agroecological approaches or these conservation uh, biological control approaches is that there are lots of different things you can do um, as a farmer. And when it, it's not a question of doing all of them. Um, it's more a question of selecting the ones that suit your particular farming system. So you might, for example, increase uh, the number of trees on your farms, applying some agroforestry, some strips with fruit trees, for example, or um, some shelter belts um, and so on. Or you might practice minimum tillage, you might have your flower strips down the edge or, or other diverse uh, uh, margins to your fields and so on. Um, one of the things that, that uh, one of the results that comes out of Central America is that um, smallholders in uh, Honduras and Nicaragua who managed uh, traditional plots in diverse agricultural landscapes where you had lots of patches of forests and diverse field margins and things, very rarely suffered, suffer outbreaks from fall army work. And it's regarded by the farmers as a minor pest in their fields. And this is in contrast to commercial farmers only a short distance away who suffer regular outbreaks and it's a major pest. So again, this all points towards the the idea that um, um, we can manage fall armyworm uh, using these conservation uh, biological control methods. Next slide, please. So ants, um, this, I'm just going to give a few very quick results from, from, uh, from around the, the world. Uh, this is from Perfecto in, in Central America. Uh, she put in this particular study, what you see there is the number of pupae that she, she put pupae into the field and then looked at how many were predated over a period of days. And what she found was that in fields, in smallholder fields that were not sprayed, over 90% of the pupae were consumed within five days. Um, and that directly corresponded to the activity of ants that she also mentioned, um, measured in those fields. Next slide, please. Um, there is also good evidence that um, no-till or reduced minimum tillage regimes increase uh, the, uh, sorry, reduce the fall armyworm damage. So here you can see the, the, the box plots with the till on the left, much higher levels of damage compared to the no-till on the right. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this very quickly, um, this is the, the same ECBE work using the push-pull system where you have um, that, that Jeff has already mentioned. So you have, in this particular system, you have um, silver leaf as the push plant. So this, the idea is it produces volatiles that the moths don't like. And then you have a pool, pool plant at the edge of the field where the moths go and uh, um, lay their eggs instead, but their survival is lower on that pool plant. And as uh, Jeff just mentioned, this was able to reduce um, fall armyworm damage on fields by 87% uh, compared to uh, traditional tillage controls. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is going on to a little bit of our work, which is not yet published. So what we've been doing is, is uh, experimental plots with intercropping and so forth over a, a large range of sites. Um, and we've been comparing 
um, forested or, or uh, tree cover landscapes, the, the, uh, landscapes with high tree cover, sorry, with landscapes with lower tree cover. Um, so we have paired landscapes at each site. And what we, one of the clearest results that we've got is looking at the pheromone trap data, we see that the incident of uh, fall armyworm moths in the pheromone traps is lower at the uh, sites with higher tree cover. Um, so suggesting that the, the tree cover is leading to uh, lower populations of, of the adult moths at least. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, I just go very quickly through these results. So this is just looking at, this is actually looking at the, uh, the control treatment. So the, 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 the traditional um, treatments in our fields. But what I wanted to look at, uh, point out here, is that all of these fields are smallholder fields in diverse agroecological settings. So they've got trees around the fields, they've got patches of uncultivated land, uh, and so on. Now, a damage score of one is no damage. And a damage score of four is still very much a level of damage that the plant can recover from. It's only when it starts getting over five that you're gonna start seeing real measurable yield loss from that plant. And what you can see here is that the median damage uh, here at six weeks is, a, is a, somewhere between one and three. So the actual, although 100% of our fields had full armyworm in it, the actual median damage on plants was very was really quite low in these smallholder settings. I want you to look at the bottom scale there. It goes from one to four on the damage. Next slide. So here we are at 12 weeks, and the scale now goes from one to three. So later in the season, a month and a half later, we've actually seen a reduction in the level of median damage in these fields. What this indicates is that the, whatever the mortality factors are, the mortality factors are preventing the fall armyworm from an exponential growth that you would expect in, in, in a situation where the mortality is not um, you know, keeping control of the, the, the pest population. So we're not seeing an exponential growth of the pest population in these smallholder fields. This is without any spraying or any, any intervention at all. This is a, uh, these are just traditional tilled fields without intercrops, without any special treatment at all. And yet even within these fields, we're seeing that the mortality factors are actually quite high and preventing um, escape of the, the pest population. Okay, next slide, please. Yes, so um, I just want to uh, quickly uh, bring about, uh, mention some other results that are coming out of Africa. So, so far they've recorded about 15 native parasitoid species in Africa that are now attacking fall armyworm. And the rates vary from about 5% to about 40% uh, parasitism rate. So um, at least, uh, and they've been found in basically every study that's looked for them. So um, it's quite clear that native parasitoids are attacking this pest. Um, I already mentioned that studies on botan botanicals have shown that they're just as effective as th synthetic pesticides. So again, suggesting that there's no need to use the synthetic pesticides. Um, studies investigating uh, mortality factors find that rainfall is a very important factor in the mortality of fall armyworm. So where you've got high rainfall, and particularly high rainfall with um, torrential rainfall events, storms, uh, this often um, causes high mortality in fall armyworm. Um, the, the other clear result, which was also shown in our results, is the background yield losses are not nearly as high as, as at first feared. However, it's still a problem. I mean, farmers who are poor are still using a, losing a percentage of their, their yields, and so this is still a problem we need to address, but it isn't the panic situation that we perhaps feared um, three or four years ago. Um, so uh, on to the next slide. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about some ongoing work and some work that um, I'm actually gonna introduce a new trial that we're doing and invite uh, collaborators to join us. So Jeff, <laughs> if you're interested in joining us, we've got something that's uh, already up and ready to go. So this is actually a, um, 
a topic that uh, we had a master's student look at. We've now got a PhD on it, uh, harnessing the power of predatory social wasps. So um, Polistes wasps and, and other social uh, wasps are big predators of uh, Lepidopteran larvae. And a single nest can feed on dozens of larvae in a single day. So they, and we have observed them in all our fields, preying on fall armyworm. So we know they're an important predator in the fields there. So we, we want to try and look at, do some more research to find out just how important they are as predators and whether there's some kind of intervention we can make that would increase their um, utility as a predator, whether we can just put some shelters out in the field, or whether we can actually cultivate them um, as we did in this um, experimental situation, uh, in the same way as you might cultivate bees. So you then have boxes with, with the nests in them that you put out, the colonies in them that you put out into your fields. Next slide. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, this is not the end of my talk because I'm about to in talk about the, the proposal we have for um, uh, a global trial. However, I want to just summarize this section of the talk um, and just saying that agroecology offers proven low cost methods, methods that can be used to control um, fall armyworm and should be um, used as a uh, um, technique in IPM. Um, however, one of the things that is lacking from um, our understanding of these approaches is where they work best. So different methods may work better, for example, in um, a dry area. For example, the push pool was developed for dry lands in, in Africa. Does it work as well in, in wetter areas? Silver leaf is very difficult to get to establish in wetter areas. So perhaps that system doesn't work quite so well elsewhere. These kinds of questions we need to understand so that we can, we can assess what methods work well. So next slide, please. Yeah, so this is a, a proposal for a global trial. And this is actually, we have already started working on this trial um, here in um, uh, Zambia and Malawi. So um, it's uh, the, in the basic treatment there, we were crossing a uh, conservation agriculture, a no-till and mulching treatment with an intercropping treatment. Um, and the basic uh, intercropping treatment is using cowpea which was selected because that was the only intercrop that we could find where you can plant it in Zimbabwe and you can also plant it in Indonesia because it's, it's used right across that whole range. So, um, so, the, so we have in the basic module of this trial, we have these four treatments. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so the aim of the trial is to examine these agroecological interventions across a diverse range of sites um, using a standardized protocol so that we can really measure you know, how the intervention varies across the context that, that it's being implemented. Like I said, we have um, a basic module with these four treatments of conservation agriculture um, crossed with intercropping. And we have both uh, on-farm and on-station versions of the, of the trial. We also recognize the need to tailor the trial to local circumstances. So we have optional modules where we've, again, standardized the, the, um, the treatment so that we can compare them across sites. Um, and these optional modules include uh, additional, uh, using additional intercrops, Using, using sorghum instead of maize, the, the, the field we use, the, the cereal crop we're looking at at the moment anyway, is maize. Um, also looking at larger plot sizes to see whether the plot size is an important consideration. Um, varying the, the, the plant spacing, because in the standardized protocol, we've, we've standardized the plant spacing so that we can compare again across sites, but sometimes local plant space, spacing is, um, can, can be more dense, for example. So we wanted to put that one in. And then we also have this treatment of, of placing a site in a low or a high tree, tree cover landscape to compare the landscape scale effects. Uh, next slide. So it's a uh, very- You've um, just got two minutes. 
Okay, so it's a very uh, simple protocol. Um, we provide, you know, exact uh, details as to how this the field should be planted. Next slide. Um, we have uh, tools to randomize the, the the replicates and the blocks. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a website set up to standardize the data collection. The data collection is all through standardized uh, tools based on a tablet. Um, so you, you can go on there, you can register your site um, and, and, the, and the particular optional protocols that you're going to, to use and the number of replicates that you want to use and so on. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and we have... Um, like I said, on the left column there, it's a little bit too small to read, but we have a whole lot of tools for the different uh, data collections. So there's a planting data collection, there's a scouting data collection done twice, then the harvest data collection, the, the legume harvest data collection, and so on. All those tools are up there. You just download them to your tablet, and walk out into a field and use them. Next slide, please. Yeah, so... Um, so we've been doing this in, in uh, Zam, uh, Zambia and Malawi. And so here you can see uh, on the right, the picture there showing a intercropping with uh, groundnuts. And on the left, the, uh, the, the, no, the, the control, the no-till, no intercropping. And in this particular field, at least, we see very large treatment effect with the uh, intercrop really preventing um, uh, a lot of the damage that was coming from fall army run. Uh, next slide, please. Great, can you see that? Yeah, that's it. So uh, yep. one thing I did forget to mention is the countries that are already involved. So we've got uh, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe. Uh, we've got Nigeria, Nepal, and... Uh, Myanmar, well, we're not so sure about Myanmar now, but at least they were involved. And then we've also had people show interest from Indonesia and uh, Cambodia and, and elsewhere, in, including in the Asian region. But uh, the ones that are confirmed are from uh, are the, the four I mentioned from um, um, Africa, O plus India as well, and Nepal and Myanmar. Okay, thank Great. you very much. Great, thank you very much, Rhett. And that was very interesting. And you do have questions. And I'm going to be very quick because we're, we're running out of time. I will um, tell everyone now that we're going to run over by 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> I'm very sorry, but I'm, I'm going to say truthfully that we've just got such good speakers. Uh, it's um, really important. I think now we're here online that we get the most out of this session. So, And I do want to ask you some questions, Rhett. Um, you, you talked about how the farmer can choose what's best for their context, but how does that farmer selects what does work best for them? I mean, do you have to give them some guidance though, around what does actually work in their potential area? I mean, for farmers to actually try things? Um, so I think it's a question of tailoring. So I think we can already say that intercropping seems to work quite well, but uh, whether you use one particular intercrop or another particular intercrop, and how well they perform um, is going to be a decision that the farmer is going to make according to you know what intercrop do they wish to harvest? Do they just want a, co a cover crop or, or or a crop that's going to you know improve the fertility of the soil, or are they actually looking for something that's going to give them a harvest? These are the kind of decisions that the farmer will want to make. So, um, uh, so I guess I'm interested in how to how to help them choose i mean to give you want to give them a choice but it's around i guess showing them what the choices are and the efficacy of each choice must be quite important well i think this is where we have um in some cases we have knowledge gaps in the science and in some cases the knowledge gap is in is with the farmers there's a there's a communication gap from the science yeah. to the farmers there's definitely a role um there's a need to examine more of these uh, interventions across more contexts so that we can get better data on yep. just how effective they excellent. are. And then there's also a, a need to communicate that better. Yep. No, excellent. Thanks, Rhett. And I think that's what Jeff was saying as well, just have a go sometimes, get out there and start trying things is, is really important. I actually have a question here, and, and it may be for you and our other speakers, but perhaps you can have a go first. But in the Philippines, we've seen that rice buns planted with ladyfinger okra, mung bean and string bean had high rates, high damage 
uh, high rates of damage. Thus, rice farmers seem to be discouraged to adopt ecological engineering. So what is your advice in this matter? And um, you think, Rhett, you you okay. have a go or we can ask Jeff or Ping Yang? Yeah, I mean, uh, try something else. Try something with nectarous uh, flowers or, or something else. I mean, it's um, if one thing doesn't work, try something else, I think is the answer there. Um, I mean, it depends, I guess, on, on what are the limits to the farmer's investment. I mean, are they using these bonds as a primarily as a pest control method or uh, are they using them to grow those uh, legumes? So I think that's the, that's the what we need to understand first. Excellent. Jeff, Jeff. So, to that. Yeah, I think it's a challenge that lends itself very nicely to some simple on-farm farmer-led experimentation. You could have relatively small plots or sections of band planted to each candidate plant species and then do direct visual observations to see, uh, you know, which of those was most advantageous. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Rhett, um, another question for you. Uh, you sort of hinted at this, um, and I think it's quite an interesting question. It's around this knowledge or what is the interaction between some of these uh, approaches between climate, achieving climate resilience and also pest resilience? I mean, what, what is the relationship there? Is, is it a very strong relationship so that farmers can, uh, I guess, multitask and against some of these threats that they're facing with conservation yeah, I mean, biocontrol? A lot of the methods that, that we're talking about, at least and in, in, in advocating for for Africa and smallholders in Africa are derived from, you know, sustainable intensification uh, interventions. So increasing, for example, the, the conservation of, of woodlots on your farm and of patches of forests, um, in using agroforestry and perennial crops, um, and, and so on, and, and diversifying your income stream so that you're not just based on, on, for example, a lot of farmers here are just farming with maize, and that's not a very good strategy. Um, because if you get a drought year, you've lost your maize crop, you've got nothing. So a lot of it supports and give, uh, gives you cross benefits to, um, you know, climate resilience, um, as well as uh, improving the agroecological environment for pest control. Okay, great. Great. Thank you. Um, Rhett, you've got lots of questions. I can see questions about ants, wasps, biopesticides, which are these successful ones, the botanicals that you were talking about before that people are using. There's there's actually 28 questions on our question and answer board there. So uh, Jeff, if you could maybe answer a few questions and Rhett, you've got a, another 10 probably at the end there as well um, that are coming in thick and fast. That would be much appreciated. I'm going to move on to Ping Yang uh, Zhu uh, and I'd like to thank Rhett for your um, Excellent presentation. And also, I'm just going to encourage people, if you're interested in, in taking part, participating in that trial, talking about it further, please contact Rhett. Um, there will be a copy of the presentation loaded later, so uh, and I will email you again um, with those details. So thank you very much, Rhett. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move on to our last speaker, and we are going to run 10 minutes late, so I'm, I apologize for that, but there's such good presentations, it's definitely worth keeping, staying here and um, hearing this information. I would really like to introduce now Dr. Pingyang Zhu, uh, who's a professor at Zhejiang, Zhejiang University in China, and he works closely with Dr. Liu, who actually, he's collaborated on this work and uh, presentation, and as you heard before, he's worked very closely with Jeff, he was actually a PhD student, I think, at Char Charles Stewart University. So there's a very good, uh, I guess, example or exemplar uh, for Jeff's call for uh, new students, etc., cetera, uh, and also working with them. Um, so Ping Yang, I'm, I'm going to welcome you and um, you can start your presentation. And I'm just going to ask you, because I know you have a lot of slides, um, very interesting, if you could move through them quite quickly, though, um, where you. possible. <coughs> yeah, yeah. OK, hello. Uh, as, uh, as Dr. Lu uh, should chair another workshop today, so, so he transferred this opportunity to me, so it's my great honor. Uh, so let's begin. Uh, today I will be talking about the pest managers by ecological engineering in China, from rice to 
maize. Uh, so at first, let's uh, learn what's, what's the ecological, uh, ecological engineering is. Uh, which ecological engineering is first uh, is a new place of science, uh, which began in the last middle uh, sentence. Uh, Audion gave the uh, first uh, conceptions and uh, with the uh, uh, improvement many times, uh, uh, now made the, the conception of myths uh, has been widely adopted, uh, uh, accept. Now next slide, thank you. Uh, in China, uh, Ma Sijun uh, first proposed the uh, first uh, uh, proposed the uh, ecological engineering on the Lucas uh, uh, cultures in 1950, uh, 1954, uh, which is solving uh, long-standing problems since more than 2,000 years ago. Uh, because at at that time, uh, the Lucas problems is a big problems uh, on the agricultural productions. Oh, next. Uh, there are many factors uh, factions of ecological engineering, such as reduce protein, uh, recycle resource, and uh, improve the foundational of the assistance for human benefit. Next. Uh, the financial growth of ecological engineering is development of a uh, sustainable existence that have both human and uh, ecological values. Next, thanks. Um, with uh, uh, as uh, one of the agricultural ecological engineering research field, uh, pest management by ecological ecological engineering has uh, increased development. Next, uh, as we are as on rice pest management uh, in recent year, uh, our research teams led by Dr. Zhong Xianlu and uh, Professor Jeff Gur uh, do a lot of research. Uh, on this subject. Next. Uh, as we all know, uh, rice is one of the most important uh, crops in the world uh, and uh, suffered more than a uh, thousand uh, insects. The most important uh, insect pests uh, in China are the are rice planter hog and the rice stem boiler and the rice leaf folders. We, uh, the <coughs> for the higher yield, farmer often uh, sprays pesticide frequently to control them, uh, but which result in future negative impact on the environment and the uh, human, uh, uh, human being. Next. Uh, besides pests, there are also a lot of natural enemies which play an important, important roles in insect pest control in the rice ex uh, existence. We can take, uh, take, take, uh, take uh, we can take many Menu, menus to, uh, uh, to to nourish the natural enemies to control the pet, uh, to control the pests uh, such as the EEs. Next, uh, EE technologies, uh, including the use of cultural practice and uh, habitat management uh, and uh, bio biological control uh, and the manual of uh, bottom up and uh, top down top down menus uh, accurate. Uh, EE for rice pest management now uh, is in integrate with uh, both strict and uh, uh, and uh, practice into a comprehensive system. So this te these te technologies uh, can enhance the existing service and uh, reduce the need for the pesticide use. Next, thank you. Uh, uh, important. Uh, technology of EE is to uh, plant back plant and uh, back plant in the rice systems. Uh, we found two back plant systems. Uh, one is this systems, uh, the uh, uh, the the lineage, uh, the common name is water, ba water bamboo. Um, a species of plant hog on the lineage uh, could establish a higher uh, populations uh, before the rice before the rice seasons. Uh, and as well as the nature, uh, one space of natural enemies, anagoras. And uh, so uh, we can estab establish a higher population of na uh, these natural enemies in the early seasons, in the rice early seasons. Uh, because this space of plant hog can't damage the rice, but the natural enemies, the anagoras, uh, 
uh, is the most important natural enemy of the rice plant hog. So uh, we, can, uh, we, sh we could use this natural enemy to, count, uh, to, uh, to uh, capture the rice plant hog uh, in the rice, se uh, rice seasons. Okay, next. Uh, here, give a note. Uh, one is the uh, expulsions of the water bamboos, and another is that uh, the experts of the anabros, uh, where over winters we uh, we in the leaves or with the water bamboos in the field. So we should keep the uh, water bamboo leaves uh, in the field during the winter. Next, uh, this is another bad plant system. Uh, uh, we also found a space of plant hop on the Lisa grass. This, this plant hop also, also can, uh, can't uh, feed the rice, feed, rice and uh, can establish a higher populations uh, before the rice seasons, and, uh, as well as the uh, two natural enemies. One is anagro, another is a, a space of merbug. They can move into, uh, uh, they can move into the rice field uh, and uh, control the rice plant hogs. Next. Mm. The field experiment uh, shows that the 10 centimeter wide uh, the Lisa grass plant at the, at the edge of the rice field can be an um, effective control against the rice plant hog. The most important is that this space of Lisa's is major than others. Uh, and it's uh, not easy for them to crack into the rice field because this space, uh, uh, the, uh, this space uh, grass uh, can't grow very well in the hot weather. Next. Uh, another important technology is uh, planting the next plant in the rice, uh, in, in the rice existence. So just, uh, just now, Professor Jeff also told a, uh, told a, a lot of this. So, Next. Here I give two notes. One is a dispute and another is we have to make sure the flowering times should cover the whole rice growth period. Next, thank you. And, uh, 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 and uh, planting the trap plant in rice systems, in rice systems is also an important measure uh, of EE technologies. We found that we found that uh, the rice stem borders uh, prefer lay eggs on this vegetable uh, grasses uh, than rice, and uh, but they can't uh, fin uh, but they uh, but they can't complete its life cycles in the vegetable grasses. The level of the rice stem borders will die in the vegetable uh, grasses. So we plant the vegetable grasses around the rice to control the rice stem borders. Next. Uh, now, uh, now we have de developed the local standard about using uh, wheatful grasses to control the rice stem borders, uh, including when and how to plant and how to management. Next. Uh, um, there are also many other EE technologies, such as uh, use a uh, filament trap to, to trap the stem border or leaf borders and uh, release uh, natural enemies, and uh, also use a uh, countercultural systems uh, as a time limit. I, I, as a time limit, I don't introduce them one by one. Next. <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is the first demonstration farmers of EEs uh, for rice pest management in China. We plant next plant uh, next plant sesame uh, is on the bump and uh, plant the bank plant uh, with bamboo or lisas uh, and uh, the trap plant in the rice field uh, and also with the other EE technologies. After uh, after using after use the EE technologies, uh, the insecticide were reduced by more than seventy percent in the EE field than the traditional farmer field. Next. Um, the abundance of natural enemies uh, were also significantly higher in EE area uh, than those in the tradi traditional farmer field. Uh, next, thank you. And the dynamic of the plant hop, the population, the population of the plant hop 
but also very, uh, show a significant low in the ecological and uh, EE field than the farmer field. Next. Uh, after using the EE technologies for rice pest man uh, manager, uh, we found that though the yield uh, in China is similar with the farmer's yield, uh, but uh, the cost of the pesticide and uh, lower uh, levels was significantly low. So the farmer also uh, welcomes this, the EE uh, technologies. Uh, they also uh, like that. Next. Uh, to better extend the EE on rice pest management, we developed the EE model diagrams, or diagrams under the technical standards. Uh, so far, more than 10% uh, of rice plant areas of Zhejiang province are being employed the e EE for rice pest management. Next. Uh, actually, EE also has been a, a national recommended. Techno uh, te uh, technologies by the Ministry of Agriculture of China uh, since 2014. Uh, we also uh, run several seminars and uh, on seed training for, te uh, for technicians and uh, farmers every year. Next. Uh, so, here, give a summary. Uh, EE has been widely adopted in China and the uh, Chinese government focus on the sustainable development. And uh, EE for pest cultures will be developer futures. Uh, ecolo uh, ecological basis pest managers in agro existence have become so increasingly important in the world. Next. Uh, as a great success in the rice pest management, uh, we have great faith uh, that EE is a potential measure to control uh, for army worms in maize crops. I felt that the predominant natural enemies uh, can be used in EE street of four army worms countries in this field, such as uh, Chukuma and uh, uh, Little Bird and uh, this wing and uh, the uh, stable, stable. Okay, next. Among the uh, Chukumas, we found more than five species of Chukumas in this field in China. Uh, next. Uh, but among the five species, only one species of Chakruma shows a great potential on control for army wars. Next. So, uh, actually, uh, as, as Jeff's suggestion, uh, suggestion we, uh, we, also, we can also use the next plant around the uh, maize field to control the four army worms. Uh, here, uh, here, we also develop uh, models uh, to select the Foreign plant. Uh, next, use these models. We can easily we can easily to determine which flower is better uh, for the natural enemies. Okay, next. Uh, for example, uh, these two species of flower. If we want to know which flower is better for the uh, natural enemies, for the parasites, we uh, uh, we have to do uh, the lab or field experiment to check it. At, uh, at before, but now, uh, if, but now, next, next slide. Uh, but now, uh, if we get the trait of the flower trait uh, and uh, fix them in these models, the models uh, will give us uh, un, uh, give, uh, will will give us uh, un, will answer it. Uh, this, here, uh, the model shows that this space flower is better for the past toys. Next, the same. The same method, we can see that this flower is not, uh, not good for the parasites. Okay, next. So, so this model is, is give a tour to determine whether a candidate next, a next plant is a suitable insectarist plant for bi uh, biological cultures. Next. Actually, we also do a lot of work on exploring the next plant for enhanced by culture Biological controls of chakramas. Next. Such, next. Uh, such as test the effect of different species of flower, uh, flower plant on the different species of chakramas, longevity, and uh, We're just.
It's just uh, off Ping Yang. Got, yeah. Ping Yang is just gone off. Uh, Jeff, uh, you're on at the moment. Um, while, while we're waiting for Ping Yang to maybe come on, uh, this is actually really interesting. It's something that we haven't actually seen, the level of detail going into the choice of all the flowers that you use in the, the flower ro uh, rows, I guess. I mean, is this is this something that's, there's been a lot of work done for this and maize. I mean, is, is this is relating to potential planting in maize uh, crops for fall armyworm? Okay. Oh, here we Hi, go. Annie. He's Ping Yang. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's wrong. No, that's okay. We were just talking about the level of detail. Is it's, it's, it's this is very interesting. We haven't seen anything like this uh, so far, and in fact, all of this presentations today are, are very different than the previous presentations. So, if you could carry on, I think you were just talking about here just the selection, looking at which ones could be selected uh, for. Uh, so, if you want to carry on. Yes, uh, please go ahead. Is that okay? Yep, go for it. Okay, go ahead. Uh huh. For launch of the next slide, thank you. Uh, and uh, we can, uh, and uh, we found many uh, several species of flower can uh, enhance both longevity and uh, quantities of the groomers. Next. Uh, at last. Uh, show an uh, interesting simple field ex examples, uh, which did in the last years. Two treatment, only two treatments. One is cavalry grass during the main season. Another uh, is weeds controlled by the herb seed. The results show that the maize plant, uh, the maize plant suffer harm rate by the four army worms is significantly low in the in the co uh, covering grass areas uh, than that in the waste control areas. That, that means the covering grass also, also is an uh, effective me uh, method uh, in, in EEs to control the four army worms. Oh, next. Yeah, according, according to the Ellison situation, so we also gave some steps for the design of EE systems. Uh, the first is that we have to uh, we have to uh, select the shootable next and the uh, bank plant uh, and uh, evaluate, evaluate the ecological uh, risk of next plant. Uh, if the next plant also benefit for the uh, insert test. Uh, and the third is we have to find the optimal distributions uh, of the next plant for natural enemies. Uh, and then um, we should manipulate the next and the bank plants uh, in non maize habit habitats for opening the best economic and uh, ecological benefit for, for farmers. Next. Next, thank you. Here, the, uh, this is a design of EE on control the, farm, uh, uh, the four army worms in this uh, in maize. Uh, we should, at first, we should uh, uh, manage the non maize habit uh, habitat. Uh, planting the next and the bank plant around the uh, maize crops and uh, intercro uh, intercrops uh, the next plant in the maize field um, to increase the biodiversity of maize to enhance the uh, existing service, in, including the pest controls. Next. Okay, next slide. Okay, thank you. That's all. <laughs> That was absolutely wonderful, uh, Ping Yang. I, I think you did an amazing job with, with those amount of slides at the very end there with the squeezed time. But that was a fantastic presentation. Um, it's really good to see all the work that has happened in rice there and the sort of proven benefits of conservation biocontrol that both you and Jeff um, sort of set out with those sort of that work. But also now looking at what you can do in maize cropping systems. Uh, and it was very, very detailed. Everyone will see the slides afterwards. There will be lots of questions probably in the next couple of days as well. Um, I have a few questions then for you. How easy is it, perhaps with the rice example, is it to get farmers to actually the, the uptake of those technical guidelines? I mean, you talked about technical standards, and I think you said there was a quite a big proportion of uh, 
percentage of farmers that were applying those technical standards in rice crops. But how easy is it to get farmers to follow that technical advice? Yes, uh, in China, we have the government powers. You know, at first we should uh, uh, we should use the government power to push to push the, the technologies to the farmers. Yeah, <clears throat> and then uh, I think the farmer uh, we are uh, looking the results. Uh, they, they 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 want to earn money, earn much much money. Uh, the EE can uh, let them earn more money than the traditional method, and they will adopt the method. I think. Excellent. That's a good point. Um, yeah. Very good point. Uh, mm -hmm. Here's another question. Do you see um, interaction happening between those different pests? I mean, you, you had, uh, I th oh, actually, have you seen fall armyworm in rice crops at all? Or is it primarily you only see it in the maize and other crops? Have you seen it on rice in China? Oh, sorry. I have you have seen it. have you seen fall army worm? Uh, is it present on rice crops? Uh, yeah, rice. Uh, had... Yeah, far from us, the uh, year in China, in most uh, area is in the rice field. Uh, we extend the EE in rice. We we extend the EEs uh, in the rice field. Uh, we spend more than about uh, 10 years in the rice field. And uh, next, we and the next we think we can extend the, this method to other crops. Okay, yes, no, no, that, that, that's, that's very true. Um, I, I see that my question was, do you notice any fall armyworm in rice crops? Or are you only seeing it in maize crops, the fall armyworm? Yeah, um, uh, sorry, I'm running crops. Sorry, it's my accent, I think. It's my New Zealand twang. Uh, the, no, fall, the, the fall army worm, are you well, only seeing it in maize crops? Uh, sorry, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> what's what the fall army Jeff can worm? translate yeah, in Australian. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. You're on mute, Jeff. Here we are. Yeah, that's right. The question, Ping Yang, is... Uh, yes. Are you seeing full army worm in rice? Uh, full army worm. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> army worm. Uh, yes. Uh, last year uh, and uh, two years ago, so we seen the first uh, uh, we the full army worms was in immigrated into China. So and uh, we we gave a power to uh, survival the full army army worms. Uh, actually, uh, the full army worms uh, was was in all, nearly all of the Chinese field now. Yeah, and yeah. on in maize crops. Okay. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, yeah. All, in maize crops and okay. uh, other crops also we can see, we can find, but only a few, very few. Okay, here's another question from Maria uh, Liberty. Um, in your ecological engineering rice tri trial, why was there a need to apply pesticides twice? Mm. So I think in your rice trial, there was a reduction in the use of pesticides, but somebody is asking, did you really need to apply pesticides at all? Uh, sorry, need two pesticides. Uh, in, so in your trial, was there a need yeah. to apply any pesticides at all, do you think, with farmers? With your uh, yeah, with farmers. Yeah, the, all the choice is local in the farmer's field. Uh, we ask the farmers to help us to uh, manage them and uh, depend, on our, uh, the, depend on our experiment determined. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, I, I've got mm -hmm. another question actually um, for you, I think, Jeff, maybe you can answer this too, uh, perhaps. It says regarding your presentation, 
Professor Gur's presentation. While I completely agree with the conservation biocontrol approach and ecological engineering of the small medium farm landscape, the science uh, oh, the science and evidence is there to support these claims. And this approach would probably be beneficial. Do you think large GM monocultures would be willing to manage their landscape in a more ecological way? If not, how could we potentially push them to achieving that? So I think they're, they're really asking, can we have uh, mix some of these technologies with conservation biocontrol more than what we do currently? Look, that's a, a question about a very, very complex area. There are, there are multiple PhD studies to be done on that. But I think the simple answer is yes, there is great scope even for intensive industrialized agricultural systems to adopt some of these softer approaches. And in the Q&A box, I just responded to a question a short time ago about cotton. And it's relevant to the current question because of course in cotton, uh, pest management the past 20 years has been kind of dominated by the advent of genetically engineered insect resistant crops. But crucially, despite this kind of magic silver bullet type GM approach, it's still really important to use ecological approaches to maintain the durability of that GM crop approach in the form of refuge areas. Um, people might want to kind of perhaps Google that term if they're not familiar with it, but were it not for the use of refuge areas, um, then um, the pest population would quickly develop resistance to the transgenic traits in the cotton itself. So even high-tech approaches like GM crops can benefit from the softer ecological type approaches that we're talking about tonight. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Actually, that's uh, almost like uh, we organised that. <laughs> that question yeah. and answer because I would just we say we, yeah. you know, I know we've got a resistance management regional resistance management plan discussion next week and actually one of the questions that I'm sure will come up will be how do we have sort of a toolbox of approaches uh, and different tools in there for people to choose and manage and use together in a, in a really integrated pest management approach um, so thank you for that um, so that, that's a very good ending and I guess on that I'm just going to actually um, I'm going to thank Ping Yang for a, a excellent presentation I've actually got lots of questions I'm going to interview you and actually do a bit of a blog on it because I think there's some really exciting stuff there for this region to think about um, and to collaborate with your work to look at how would we build some of that work into um, the biocontrol program for uh, the ASEAN Fall Army Worm Action Plan. So thank you so much, really appreciate it. I'm just gonna bring on uh, Dr. Feng Zhang from CABI quickly um, because we've, we're running out of time but we're not that far over and such good speakers, it's a fantastic fantastic time to spend with each other. Uh, Fang, are you there? Have you unmuted yourself? Yes, yeah, thank you, Edison. Yeah, uh, sorry that first I have to say I'm not the expert uh, in conservation biology control. Uh, uh, my background is more in classical bio control and augmented bio control. Maybe I can have a small chat with Jill <laughs> later <laughs> about the benefits you know, <laughs> uh, for the practices, uh, but anyway, uh, I like the three presentations very, very much uh, because they not only give theories, but also they give very good examples how they work in practices. That's I liked very lot. And also they give a detailed explanation on how to do the conservation by control. I think that's very important. As far as the, uh, I think the conservation by control is uh, uh, considered uh, for, the, for the uptake and the scale up uh, by local farmers. Uh, I think it's important uh, to uh, bring the farmers to the, uh, to the picture, uh, to involve them in the very beginning of the research. Uh, I think Jeff mentioned the farmer-led uh, research or demonstration. That's really a brilliant idea, I think, uh, for not only conservation by control, but also for other type of biological control that to make sure that farmers uh, are really involved. And also they have, they have their own traditional knowledge, I believe, 
that they observe their field, they might notice the uh, differences uh, between the fields. So I think I believe the knowledge there uh, would help us to develop uh, some good practices. Uh, just in short, to summarize, I also like Jeff's uh, uh, summary, the snap. <laughs> that made me feel a uh, link with always think about the Thanos in Avengers, you know, in Avengers. And there's a snap, the problem. Uh, that's different, of course. Could be the snap that the formula problem will be gone forever and leave farmer and ourselves in peace. Thank you, Alison. Back to you now. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm just going to bring it to an end, but I'm just going to say it's a pleasure to have you all here listening. Um, we've kept virtually everyone right through to the end. So it's been very interesting. It's a good sign that people have really um, triggered really good thinking there. And I think what I liked across all the speakers um, and with Rhett's one as well, uh, is just that idea that we need to collaborate more on this. Um, we need to just get out there and try things. I think that's really important because we can talk a lot for a long time, but we need to get in the field and find out what works and what doesn't and work with farmers um, who are actually naturally curious and want to find out what works for them as well. So let's work together on this. We'll keep up the conversation. Uh, it's good catalyst today. Um, it'll carry on. Um, and so if you want to... Uh, uh, join us for our next session. It'll be on the 6th of May. It'll be biocontrol as part of an IPM approach. That's going to be interesting. It's going to tie a lot of these things together. Um, and we will further go on with the um, with a workshop uh, in June, July on the actual development of our biocontrol program. So there's lots happening. Keep in touch. Make sure you go to the website, register your interest, um, share some of your knowledge and your work with us because that is the way that we learn about who's doing what. Uh, we don't know if you don't tell us. Um, so please do that. And I'd like you to um, have a great afternoon, great morning, great night, wherever you are across the world. And thank you very much for participating. Thank you to our wonderful speakers. Thank you for Pranav for helping out at the back end. We've got lots of questions um, that we might actually keep a record of and we'll come back to you um, and post those on our site so that we have cute questions and answers to help guide um, you uh, further. And we do have a feedback poll. So please answer it. it everything is, um, I think it's anonymous, um, but it doesn't matter. We're not going to look anyway. So please be honest. Um, and take care, everyone. Keep safe. Thank you.